Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have questions. Just how dangerous is spyware like Pegasus? And how much danger are ordinary citizens like you and me in because of our phones? Let's get to the bottom line. Today, no one lives without a phone basically stuck to them all day. Of course, smart devices make our lives more efficient, but they also generate records of almost everything we do, becoming little spies in our pocket. For the most part, we don't care when businesses track us, but things get more dangerous when intelligence agencies want to know where you're going and what you're doing and what you're thinking, what you're saying in private, and whose company you keep. One of the most powerful spywares out there is made by an Israeli company called NSO Group. And the software that governments can buy is called Pegasus. It has the power to extract your contacts, your messages, photos, movements, and more without you ever knowing. Recently, a group of newspapers and human rights groups got together to expose just how insidious the spying has become. The investigation found that it's being used against human rights activists, against business leaders, heads of state and other government officials, politicians, and journalists all over the world. So how pervasive is this digital surveillance, and what do we do to turn the tables on those watching us? Jamal Khashoggi was monitored by this very software, so too his fiance. Are the lives of social activists and journalists today in danger as they agitate to change the world or try to reveal the truth? Today we're talking with three experts who've been focusing on this threat posed by Pegasus. Dana Priest is a reporter for The Washington Post, and she's the co-author of a series of investigative pieces known as The Pegasus Project, which found that the spyware is being used in at least 50 countries. The Pegasus Project was done in partnership with Amnesty International, and we'll be talking with the secretary general of that global human rights group at the great Agnes Calamard, and John Scott Ralton from Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, which has been analyzing Pegasus on infected phones and exposing how it works for years now. Thank you all for joining us today on this important conversation. John, let me start with you, because you and Citizen Lab were among the first I began reading years ago that were essentially warning that the, the, the fear that we all had, that, that governments were potentially tracking us, uh, was happening. Can you sketch what has been unfolding and what your principal concerns are? Well, first of all, thanks for having me and for this great panel. One of the things that I think it's important for people to know is that the industry is not new. We're just learning about it because it's growing and the scale of harms that it's causing are growing as well. This is an industry that basically says to governments around the world, look, you want to hack. Maybe you don't have that technology within your country, but you can do it if you have a big enough checkbook. And companies like NSO, but also companies with names like Hacking Team from Italy before them, Finn Fisher from Germany and the UK before that, have gone to governments and said, look, we will sell you an untraceable technology for pervasive surveillance, first to people's laptops and computers, more recently their phones, and you do with it what you will. The industry says this is about stopping terror, this is about preventing crime. But for the last decade, myself, my colleagues, and some of the researchers at Amnesty International have documented how extensively this software is misused. If there's a bottom line here, it's that if a government gets it and they don't have good oversight, they will abuse and misuse it. Thank you. Agnes Calamard, when I uh, saw the reporting by Dana Priest and others on this and saw that uh, there were more than 50,000 numbers and began looking at some of those uh, who were on there, including uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, phone, uh, the president of France, where, where you are now, and you began looking at countries all around the world and that it wasn't, was, as John said, necessarily those that were engaged in, you know, mob-like transnational criminal activity or transnational terrorism, but these were journalists, human rights advocates, and others. You know, tell us what the, tell us what our fears ought to look like, given what you helped discover and helped uh, uh, disclose. I think um, there are two or three uh, dimensions to the res recent revelation. The first one is their global reach. The fact that so many countries, so many people are concerned. And in the past, we had received anecdotal evidence of individuals being targeted. Right now, with uh, the latest um, uh, discovery, what we are finding out is that the scale of the phenomenon, the global reach of, um, of the Pegasus spyware and of governments using it, it is a systematic problem. It is a systemic form of violation. So that's the first point. 
The second is the, the range of violations that um, come from uh, the use of Pegasus. Of course, we are aware that by using spyware, people are undermining and violating our right to privacy. What we are also finding out is that governments are violating the right to freedom of expression. They are violating uh, uh, freedom of the media. They are violating political uh, rights because a number of political parties, members of the oppositions of different countries, have been targeted. They are also involved in potentially violating the right to life because surveillance of that nature is the first step towards far greater violations such as abduction, disappearances and killings, as Jamal Khashoggi has shown. And finally, you pointed to the example of the French president. He was targeted by a foreign country on his own territory. And that is not the only example. Journalists in France were targeted by EG Morocco. So um, those governments are using the spyware extraterritorially. Therefore, we can, you know, we can conclude that this is a weapon which has been potentially very dramatic implication for war and peace. So that, I think, is the latest um, uh, revelation. And, and the fact that we are so badly equipped to respond to it as a global society. Well, thank you. Uh, Dana Priest, um, you won a Pulitzer Prize, as I recall, for a series that you did in The Washington Post on America's intelligence industrial complex and looking at the enormous sprawl of that intelligence complex and the fact that there was very little accountability baked in or cornering or channeling, you know, that capacity. Is the work that you're doing on the Pegasus Project essentially the globalization of the same phenomena that you wrote about, about the U.S. case? Well, I do think it is, but in a particular way, electronic surveillance. It is, uh, as Agnes says, this is a weapon. Israel requires that the Ministry of Defense approve each sale to each country because of its sophistication. It's a military-grade software. And that tells you something important. It's very powerful. It's hard to detect. And Pegasus, the NSO group that owns it, is selling it not just to anybody. They're selling it to co countries in the Gulf who are already very repressive against their own citizens and they are citizens who have fled and have are now living in exile. They're also selling it, we learned, to uh, faltering democracies, Mexico, India, um, Hungary, places where we'd like to see democratic, that would like to see democracy strengthened, not weakened. And yet the spyware we learned and, and others who reported on this earlier is being used against uh, independent journalists, not just journalists, but independent ones that are really trying to bring information to the citizenry. And finally, I'd like to I'd like to note you mentioned the industrial complex uh, of intelligence, which really grew up after 9/11. This is a great example of how this industry, in particular, is unregulated. In most of these countries, there is no regulation that says how you should use this type of equipment. In the Western democracies, there are laws that limit it, and still those laws are often abused, as we saw when Edward Snowden's documents were leaked. But in the rest of these countries, there, there's no regulation. And the international community, I think, uh, is more or less united in the call for some type of regulation, which would mean also some type of transparency. Right now, this company is very secretive. It denies everything that we've ever said about it and others. And so uh, there's no way to even, even vet what they're doing right now. And that would be part of any kind of international regime that, that looked at this industry and tried to regulate it to some degree. Dana, just, just one of the other elements that's come up recently is the potential complicity of a number of Americans in this story, uh, even former Obama administration officials that have been 
uh, advisors or had been consultants to the holding company of NSO Group. Uh, this had been reported in The Guardian, also the American Prospect. So is there a complicity, a culpability of certain Americans in this, in this story of the, uh, of, the, of the actual software company itself? This is not unusual. Uh, you know, look at every general just about that leaves uh, the military. Where do they go to work? They go to work for defense contractors. So, yes, you have liberals and conservative activists, politicians, and, um, you know, in this case, political officials who became consultants to NSO. Hmm. Really, that shouldn't surprise us because uh, this industry and, and these types of industries offer such lucrative deals to people who can schmooze their way for them into, into government. And that raises another point. NSO is really spending a lot of money in the United States on increased lobbying because it wants now to, to, to capture the market, to get in here with law enforcement, with FBI, and with others, I'm sure the CIA, uh, it would like to sell its wares to those uh, agencies as well. And so far, we can't find a trace of them here. They used to be here, but we can't. We, we have not found them to be here uh, so far, but they're definitely making efforts. John, is there any chance, as you look at this struggle with how wired and interconnected we are and how, I, I don't even know if I can even mention it, whether, whether privacy exists in any real way anymore, but what right. are your thoughts about this? Because. I have to tell you, I'm so kind of feel desperate in this moment. We know that most governments and most countries don't have serious oversight frameworks for this technology. And even governments that do have some oversight, there wind up being abuses. The real fear that I see here, though, if we pivot this from the technology to the feeling, is that for many authoritarians, fear is the tool. Self-censorship is the point. Mm. And if people feel that they can be monitored if their most intimate personal lives can be monitored through this cell phone, which is basically attached to them, they may censor themselves. They may think, you know, I'm not sure I should criticize X or Y powerful person. They may think that about somebody in their country, but as we're seeing with Pegasus, they may start having to make that calculation about people a thousand miles or an ocean away. Mm. That is absolutely fuel for growing authoritarianism, and it's something that has to be breached. Well, let me ask uh, Agnes Calamard a big kind of geopolitical question with this. And, and you know, I don't know where it's going to come out, actually, in this, because, I, you know, Agnes, you've been so involved with the United Nations, so involved with major, you know, transnational human rights NGOs like Amnesty International. But I guess my question is, you know, I'm wondering, like, who's going to blow the whistle? If you have European nations inside the EU with the acquis communautaire committed to certain values and rule of law, who are buying this software and using it against their people, you know, where, where do you go with that? If you have the United States that may not have bought the software, I don't know, I haven't seen reporting on that, but nonetheless, you have January 6th protests and you have a kind of complicated question around democracy going on in this country. Where is the beacon on the hill or where is the leadership that you see to try to reverse these trends and either shame these nations or develop protocols against them? Is there a playbook that you see that can help turn this tide? It's in your hand. It's in my hand. Um, I think what we are witnessing right now is uh, the cowardice and the lack of um, commitment on the part of governments to take actions. I think most governments, including those that have been targeted at the moment, are just hoping that the wave of attention will pass away and that they will continue business as usual. It is, in, it is up to you, it is up to us, to try to, um, to put an end, or at least to minimize the negative impact of that industry. One, we must, uh, we must bring the case to court. A number of journalists, activists, are going to court on the basis of the revelations. More must do that. There needs, we need to involve judges, we need to involve courts. There have been a couple of good cases related to surveillance, uh, including targeted surveillance. There needs to be more. If we cannot be protected by our governments, let's try to be protected by our, um, by our judges and by our court. Civil society must get organized. We, um, uh, you know, you, you did say uh, very well that few governments have, have 
an intention or an interest in uh, in doing anything. The week uh, before Pegasus was revealed in France, a new law was adopted on targeted surveillance, among other things, that made it even easier for the police and others to um, to get involved in surveillance without the level of protection that we will require. At the moment, it is um, a big problem globally. There is no control over that industry at international level, but it is feeding on the fact that domestically, nationally, um, democracies as other states have very poor uh, protection against targeted surveillance. So as actors, as people who vote, uh, as um, journalists, we must really act so that there are laws being adopted at national level that protect us against targeted surveillance by our own uh, government. How do you arm yourself? How do you teach your students to be prepared for this kind of harassment and uh, surveillance from those they're trying to report on? Well, I teach journalism students, and and security is one of the basic things we teach now, which was not the case in my day. Uh, and I'm still surprised at how young students are surprised at how big their digital exhaust is. This de definitely uh, adds a huge leap to that because most people, I think, believe that a smartphone, especially Apple, they've done a good job at marketing themselves as having a secure device, is not in fact secure. And on, the, on top of that, there's nothing you can do really to make it secure. Hmm. So this is good for me because I think journalists need to go talk to people face to face more. So that hmm. is one of the one of the solutions is to stop using your devices for everything and to go back and talk to people face to face. But of course, you know, that is not an ultimate solution. I teach about the surveillance industry now as part of a global campaign of censorship in so many countries, just like John was saying, it's the fear. Fear equals censorship, mm. self-censorship, but also censorship in newspapers that depend on tax revenue for uh, advertising, that sort of thing. So it has, it has a vast reach, just this one industry does. You know, John, I would love to get your thoughts on that as well. But in doing so, I should say that the NSO group has denied uh, that this list is, 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 is accurate. They have denied uh, that Pegasus was used to yeah. track Jamal Khashoggi and his fiance. They've denied uh, a culpability and said that if they saw these practices, they would shut down um, those clients. So I guess I'd ask you the extra, you know, B question, which is when you yeah. have discovered what you have, but you have a firm that has officially denied any culpability with, with regards to this, what's the pathway forward, the responsible pathway forward? Well, this is a great question, and let's let's address it head on because I think Dennis said a good a good number of things about journalism. I would just observe every time we at Citizen Lab investigate a case of a nation state operation and governments hacking gone wild, journalists are among the target. They are among the targets. They are the through line in so many cases of hacking that we observe. And it's no accident. First, they do the work, they go out and they find sources and they get people to talk to them who governments want to monitor. But secondarily, especially for authoritarian regimes, journalists are among the truth tellers that those regimes would like to stifle and stop and monitor. With respect to NSO's denials, this is a company that has denied everything it can for as long as it can. And it only begrudgingly admits certain facts when the evidence is public and incontrovertible. I think you're looking at an industry that is trying to borrow from the big tobacco playbook. Seed uncertainty, question the science, don't necessarily provide much of an alternate experiment, mm -hmm. an alternate explanation, just go for the researchers. And this to me highlights why this industry is incapable right now of self-regulation, which is the industry will say, look, we understand how we work. We have to operate in secrecy. Let us take care of the human rights issues. What we find, though, again and again, is that when the industry is shown to be doing bad things, instead of investigating, instead of taking action, and instead of reforming their practices, they may send private spies against those who find things out, or they may simply embark on a well-funded PR campaign 
of denial. That is not the mark of a responsible industry, and it's not a way forward for limiting the harms that the industry is doing. Agnes, um, as the revelations have come out about the governments that have purchased the soft, this software and yeah. used it um, uh, out there, you know, for whatever purposes, have any of them essentially been introspective, stepped forward, been chastened and say, we're going to change our practices? Has any single country on that list said, hey, sorry, we shouldn't be doing this? No, that's what I was saying. Um, it's actually very depressing that even country that, would, I mean, we would expect um, uh, take action such as France, because they were targeted, the, the, the president was targeted, several ministers were targeted. In Mexico, the current president and, you know, his close circle was targeted, but their response has been so weak. Um, so, you know, so muted and, um, you know, we, we, we're going to establish a committee, we're going to investigate this. I mean, the only thing the French government has done thus far is to confirm the findings of Amnesty Security Lab, uh, because they also went and, um, and explored the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the mobile phone of various people and concluded that uh, their phones had indeed been um, uh, been hacked by by Pegasus so they've done that it's not at least it's one thing but no the governments have been um, uh, have been remarkably weak and that's that's the biggest problem in my view and if I may add uh, to follow up on, on on NSO you know it's beyond NSO failing in its due diligence what we are uncovering right now is really a form of corporate complicity in human rights violations committed by the state. They cannot just say or pretend that they did not know. But Dana, do you think that modern society is going to be able to make, you know, shore up those ethical dimensions of how you use facial recognition software to find lost kids and not use them as a way to uh, control and conjole uh, everyone in society? I mean. Uh, it, it, are, is is the essential inevitability of technology being the enemy? Is that what we're talking about here? Technology is always going to advance. The key here is now it has advanced so much further ahead of laws. And people, even Facebook, you know, that's been around for a long time now, and legislators still can't figure out how to make it stop abusing the product. Mm. So our lawmakers... Right. Citizens uh, at every level need to need to be able to catch up and rein these things in. We did it with nuclear weapons to a large degree. We did it with other sorts of weapons, and this these are all weapons that we need to we need to confront and we need to confine. Well, we will end it there. I really appreciate the conversation and your candor. Washington Post reporter Dana Priest, Amnesty International Secretary General Agnes Calamard, and Citizen Lab senior researcher John Scott Rileton, thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. So what's the bottom line? Tech advances like artificial intelligence, big data, facial recognition, and the cloud are double-edged swords. They do make our lives easier, but they're also weapons used by states to control and monitor us. This is exactly what's going on with NSO Group and Pegasus. Just know this, if a government wants to find you, it will. You think your WhatsApp messages are encoded and you have software that will protect you? Think again. Russian President Vladimir Putin might have nailed it when he said that the facade of democracy is over. He and most leaders are active cheerleaders for illiberal states that don't care what citizens want, and they definitely don't care about your privacy. Honestly, there's not much we can do. Just remember that your phone is your frenemy, half friend, half enemy. And that's the bottom line.